Hello and welcome again to the Rider Review. This is Eric Rock Rider, and uh, this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2003 crime drama movie titled Wonderland. Now, Wonderland, of course, is loosely based on the infamous Wonderland murders that happened back on July 1st, 1981. Yes, the uh, night where four bodies were found in the home of I believe it was 8763 Wonderland Avenue, located in the Laurel Canyon area in California, around the Hollywood Hills in California. And some people have often dubbed it as one of the most one of the most heinous crimes since the Tate LaBianca murders due to the Manson family. Now, the runtime of this movie is one hour and 44 minutes long. It is directed by James Cox. The script was written by James Cox, Captain Mausner, Tom Samovitz, and D. Lauriston Scott. It is produced by Michael Pastornik and Holly Wiersma. The, sc the score was composed by Cliff Martinez, the cinematography by Michael Grady. And it was edited by Jeff McAvoy. And the stars of the movie are uh, Val Kilmer, Kate Bosworth, Lisa Kudrow, Dylan McDermott, Josh Lucas, Tim Blake Nelson, Christina Applegate, Janine Garofalo, Natasha Gregson Wagner, Ted Levine, Carrie Fisher, Faison Love, Eric Bogosian, Jolie Polsonetti, MC Ganey, jo Joel McAlee. Frankie G, Paris Hilton, and Scoot McNary. So in many reports in the Los Angeles area, they have frequently quoted that everyone seems to know each other's business. But the complex thing about police work in that area, or maybe even any other area in particular, is that you never hear the same story twice. Why is that? Because everybody's going to have a different take on their stories. People are not going to, you know, like, say they're to blame. Because if they actually come out and admit that they're, and admit that they're to blame, well, then they've opened up their own can of worms. They open up Pandora's box, and Pandora's box is going to be more difficult to close. Because, of course, you know, the old saying goes, you know, you never blame the reflection in the mirror. No, there's going to be people who are going to say different sides of the story. They're going to take different sides. And in the end, you end up having a cold case because there is never really a clear answer. Most police reports are going to have that. They're going to go with the, oh, I didn't do it. Oh, yeah? Well, who did? Was it you? No, it wasn't me. Well, then who did? Now look at me. Well, somebody's got to do it. You don't have four dead bodies lying on the ground, and they didn't practically do it on their own. Somebody had to do it. Well, what I'm getting at is that in most police reports, people are going to have different things to say. You never get the same story twice. You're, like, you're likely to have one person tell their side of the story, and the next thing you know, they will tell their story from a different perspective. And it, which favors who they want to side with or who they want to have justice served. But this is also what makes this movie stand out. Now, I'm not actually going to praise this movie because there's a lot of flaws in this movie. But one, there is a few idiosyncrasies that makes this movie stand out. Is that even we, the audience, can pick a side. We get to actually choose... Who actually is the guilty one. And just like as I mentioned before. The same story is never repeated. But through the suspects. 
And though the, the suspects may be biased by means of selfishly saving their hides from potential long-term jail sentences, one thing you can always guarantee on, a cop knows their suspect's identity, their locations, and who they're associated with. There is no hiding from them when they are on the run. So you could say all kinds of things that like this person did it or that person did it or you, me, everyone. Of course, it's never yourself. No. If you go out and blame yourselves, you might as well just you may as well just throw yourself in jail and throw away the key. You may as well just do your own self-made incarceration. You don't want that now, do you? No, nobody does. But yeah. Yeah. When it comes to police reports and interrogations, everybody will have a different thing to say. But when you combine the drug scene with the Hollywood elites, the connections and the breakdowns actually can be quite interesting in its storytelling but complex to those who are working on the crime scenes due to the hectic tasks at hand, like questioning the victims and the suspects. And, of course, let's not forget the heavy paperwork involved and trying to piece a complex puzzle as to what really happened. Hey, we viewers have it easy. All we got to do is just watch the movie. And then... You know, we can either go into more further, deeper research into it. Or we could just simply just watch it and then forget it later. I like to choose to go further. Yeah, call me a nerd all you want. I don't give a fuck. But I like to actually watch my movies and then I like to sort of get a better understanding. Because this is an actual fascinating True story this movie was based on. It's based on actual real events. And that's what makes this movie stand out very well. And you know what the best part about this movie too is? Is that even 40 years to this day, it's still a cold case. There is no clear evidence as to, as to who killed these four people in the Wonderland murder, when the Wonderland murders. I mean, this was a quadruple homicide. We know that, I don't know if these guys were, unless they were doing some kind of actual sacrificial suicidal ritual, I, which I highly doubt is, is a crime scene. There is proof that, that this was a work and not just, I mean, you just don't have four dead bodies lying on the ground for no apparent reason. There's got to be, there's got to be a suspect. And of course, nobody's going to say they're the suspect. Oh, no. And though, you know, many cases have been successful, many have remained cold, like the Wonderland murders. Sometimes more high prolific crime scenes definitely get more attention when someone actually famous gets involved. Like the Tate LaBianca murders in the late 60s due to, you know, the, the, the Manson family. Of course, people would not really remember the Manson family, but because the, the, the victims in this was a celebrity, I mean, we had of course, Sharon Tate, who, um, of course, was one of the victims in the Tate LaBianca murder scene. And a lot of the events of this happened at the home of Sharon Tate and film director Roman Polanski. Fortunately for Polanski, he was out shooting a video somewhere. But unfortunately, but Sharon Tate and her, her pregnant child inside... Well, they were not that lucky. 
But if it wasn't for the fact that celebrity was involved, nobody would know who the fuck the Manson family were. This murder actually made the Manson family, especially its ringleader, Charles Manson, into one of the most heinous, murderous psychopaths that walked the earth. Okay, yeah, I shouldn't speak ill will of the dead, but, you know, even people who have died, you just can't just say, oh, well, he was just misunderstood. You're such a mean person. You're talking ill of the dead. I'm sure he's had his demons fought. He's probably rotting in hell, so why, why add salt to the wounds? Well, guess what? When I die, I don't want to be always remembered for the good things I've done. I've done quite a few bad things myself. And I also want to be remembered for those bad things I have did. Okay, maybe I didn't do anything like particular in a way that, that had gotten me into severe trouble or severe consequences. But I had my weaknesses and my flaws. And, and, I, have, and I have a lot of weaknesses. And I've done a lot of things I'm not particularly proud of. And I want to be remembered just for, not just... For all the good things I have done in my life. But I have also want to be remembered for the bad things I have done in my life. I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not, I'm not dishonest about the things I've done. I've done a few terrible things in my life. That could probably never be fully forgiven. Never mind this whole don't talk ill of the dead. Show some respect. You could show me respect, sure. But they just don't have to coddle about all, about, oh, he wasn't so bad. No, I wasn't so bad. But I wasn't all 100% a saint either. That's kind of like what I'm trying to get at. Like I said, the Manson family would have never been known had it not been for the fact that a celebrity was involved in this crime scene. You know, just like the O.J. Simpson trial. If it would have been just some average individual, nobody would have given out a fuck. But because this was O.J. fucking Simpson, the O.J. Simpson trial became kind of like the crime, the court case, the court case of the, of the late 20th century. So, you know, just by having a celebrity involved in a crime scene will get definitely more exposure than somebody who is not a well-known celebrity. Wonderland is about John Holmes, played by Val Kilmer, who was at one time a legend in the porn industry. I believe he actually made a record by making something like almost 2500 porn films in the in the 60s and 70s but after his fame began to dwindle he turned to another life he turned to drugs and his addiction led to crime which then led to potential murder Holmes was along with his druggy friends Ron Launius, played by Joss Lucas, Billy Deverell, played by Tim Blake Nelson, and David Lind, played by Dylan McDermott, that while he was short on cash to pay them back, he suggested to rob the house of a vicious gangster named Eddie Nash, played by Eric Bogosian, because of the fact that he's loaded with cash. Well, Eddie Nash also was a guy who um, not only was... He also owned a nightclub. And, uh, well, obviously the guy also was loaded with cash. He was easily probably one of the richest people within that area. And um, I think also, you know, Lanius' gang was also dealing with him and selling antique guns. But then, of course, you know, once, uh, once Holmes' uh, money was kind of like 
starting to fade out. Uh, of course, you know, he suggested Lania, Steverell, and Lind that in order to get their money back, they must, you know, like, try to go into the house of gangster Eddie Nash because Nash is stashed with cash. Yeah, I know. Nobody likes a rhymer. So the gang breaks into his estate and steals his money and his expensive belongings, including antique guns. Holmes then carelessly enters into Nash's home and gets a beating for his efforts. Now, Nash could have easily just killed Holmes right on the spot, but Nash stops. Unless Holmes can identify who broke into the house. Holmes claimed, Holmes claimed he led Nash's bodyguards to the whereabouts of his accomplices located at 8763 Wonderland Avenue in Laurel Canyon in the Hollywood Hills. So, to say that Holmes was not involved would be wrong. Maybe he was just a conspirator. Or maybe he was just a whistle. Well, make no mistake about it. He's a whistleblower. Yes, he's, he's a snitch puppet. Make no mistake about it. I mean, I'm not saying that Lonnie S. Deverell, Lind, and whoever else was involved. They, were that, they weren't that innocent either. They're no saints. I mean, this movie does not have any really redeemable, likable characters, with maybe with the exception of one, which I will get to a bit in a late, which I will get to in a bit later. But we're dealing with some rather unlikable people, whether they were victims or whether they were perpetrators. There is no clear-cut good guys here. These are horrible people doing horrible things. And I'm not here to take any sympathy or umbrage for anybody. There is no less of two evils or less of many evils. Almost every character in this movie, except for one, are evil. These, some of these people, they deserve what they got. So, so make no mistake about it, John Holmes is a snitch. But the question is, but the question is, the question we want to know is, did he actually commit these murders? So four people were killed. Uh, of course, uh, Lanius and Billy. Why am I calling him Billy? I keep calling him Billy all the time. I don't know why. Bobby. So Ron Lanius, Bobby Deverell, there, I got it right. I keep calling him Billy, I don't know why. I don't know, he looks more like a Billy than a Bobby. All right, we also had uh, Lynn's girlfriend, Barbara Richardson, played by Natasha Gregson Wagner, and the leaseholder of the house and Deverell's girlfriend, Joey Miller, played by Janine Garofalo. All four of them were beaten to death with uh, with the assistance of Nash's bodyguards. Well, instead of using guns, because that would be too messy, uh, they practically beat them to death with lead pipes. I don't know, maybe it's just less messier, or, or at least guns are are like easy targets for fingerprints. So I guess lead pipes would be the better bullet. <laughs> okay. I, I sh Why am I even laughing? This is not funny at all. This is fucking serious here. Anyhow, yeah. All four of these people were dead. Lanius, Deverell, Lynn's girlfriend, Barbara Richardson... The leaseholder of the house and Deverell's girlfriend, Joy Miller, all of them dead on the floor. 
only Susan Lanius, which was uh, Ron's wife, played by Christina Applegate, she's the only one who survived. Oh, don't worry, the detectives tried to question her, but she was practically incoherent in the things she said. And we just really couldn't make out because she's like semi catatonic. And um, so it, she wasn't really much of a help, unfortunately. This marked as one of the most horrifying crime scenes since the Tate LaBianca murders of 1969. Now, the reason why Holmes was suspected of these murders was because of Liberace's lover, Scott Thorson, testified to the police that he was a witness to watching Holmes being beaten by Nash. So that's where Holmes gets like into the picture. was because while... And that makes sense, because Nash was actually the first person to actually own a club where he actually, in the Los Angeles area, which was actually an open invitation for LGBTQ members to enjoy the nightlife. Hey, New York had Stonewall. Nash actually had an establishment for LGBTQ people to enjoy the nightlife. In whatever they wish they want to do. Up to them. And Thorsten. He was just a witness to. What was happening. He had nothing to do with it. So. He's off the hook. You know I really had to dig up research. For this crime. Because after watching Wonderland. To be honest with you. I know I've been praising this movie quite a bit. But to be honest with you, this movie could have been a lot better. But I, but when I was watching the movie Wonderland, I had no idea what I was watching. A lot of the stuff about the Wonderland murders was mostly from my research because the movie didn't really do justice. Until then, the only thing I knew was that Holmes was convicted of the man who planned the murders and that Eddie Nash was acquitted of the murders and kind of lived his life until his death in 2014 at the age of 85. I mean, it's not to say that Eddie Nash lived a free life. No, he was convicted of several smaller misdemeanors, but was never really ever convicted of the Wonderland murders. As for Holmes, there was no clear evidence as to whether or not he did it or whether he did it or not. And um, I believe he too was acquitted. He did manage to make a return in the porn industry, but six years later, after the Wonderland murders, he would pass away from AIDS. We hear different sides from other stories. Um, you bet you're wondering, like, okay, I talk about that Lanius dies and Deverell dies and, you know, um, Lynn's girlfriend and Joy Miller, who was Deverell's girlfriend, they all perished. Susan Lanius was the only one who survived. But then you actually ask yourself, where was David Lind? Well, apparently David Lind wasn't at the home at the time. I don't know where he was, but he wasn't home when this he wasn't at the home when this happened, so that doesn't necessarily mean he was off the hook. But he does actually get to tell his side of the story, and he firmly believes that John Holmes was was one of the people who was involved in this quadruple homicide. 
but still never the once do they admit that Nash sent his guards to commit the murders. The movie is deeply inspired by the movie Rashomon, in which they use possible suspects to tell their side of the story, one contradicting the other. It goes back again to the whole, I'll say one thing and somebody will say something completely different. One person will try and weasel their way to making them out as if they were innocent, when really maybe they weren't. Everybody's going to tell a different side of the story. No stories ever repeat. At least one thing that you can always count on is that Rashomon was explained much clearer and we were able to fully get which side of the story was told in an immaculate presentation. Wonderland seems to have a ball tapping into the timelines repeatedly with really no clear clarifications. Too many timelines subtitles like the months later or July 1st 1981 it tends to get under your skin and at times adds confusion to the non-linear narrative. The performers working outside the timelines have their work cut out for them as they try to at least make their characters convincing in order to make the film less laboring. Val Kilmer was very convincing as John Holmes and he succeeded in, in keeping the plethora of emotional integrity to a full capacity. We see him from going from a charming, ugly, self-loathing, desperate but most of all, he needs his fix. In his porn career, Holmes made over 2,500 porno films in a career that spanned over a decade. But by the time he abandoned the porn industry and entered the drug enterprise, Kilmer solidified his stance, playing a character whose drug habit has become an obsession. And though Kilmer pulls off this role convincingly, it doesn't mean that Holmes himself is that interesting as a character. He's just a glorified case study. Nothing more, nothing less. Just a guy convicted of a crime he may or may not have committed. On the other hand, Eric Bogosian as Eddie Nash, well, he doesn't fare better, and he's only serving as a figure to the plot of the narrative. And like I said before, there are actually, there's only really one character who I, I can fully get invested in. But the thing is, is that she's not actually on that often. The only characters to the film that have a certain amount of human interest are from the two important people in Holmes' life. His underage girlfriend, Don Schiller, played by Kate Bosworth, and his estranged wife, Sharon Holmes, played by Friends star, Lisa Kudrow. Oh my goodness, Lisa Kudrow's performance, let me say one thing, is very, very underrated. And she makes you just want to forget about her free-spirited hippie character of Phoebe from uh, the Friends series. She's just playing it really straightforward. Who can and she actually can show that she can play drama just as effectively as she can play comedy. So are these two women now now the question we ask is why these two women want anything to do with a deviant like Holmes is completely unknown. But my guess is that Schiller thinks his reputation puts him at the level of celebrity. And as for Sharon, well, it's because she still has feelings for him through all the trials and tribulations. She eventually did divorce him, and she actually did live a normal life after that, except that she never remarried. It still surprises me that the love triangle between Holmes, 
Schiller, his wife Sharon, they never really get much screen time. And, and Schiller and Sharon, they seem to be somewhat friendly with each other. Albeit Holmes is obviously cheating on his wife. And I guess my assumption as to why Sharon Holmes is so much on good terms with Don Schiller is because, let's face it, she's underage, she's, teen, she's a teenager, and maybe she still has, you know, a chance to redeem and rectify from her from her mistakes and of having to deal with a guy like John Holmes. And that, I guess she kind of takes some level of, of, of sympathy and wants to probably want to lead her to the right direction and being with a deviant like John Holmes is not the way to go. I guess she just says, hey, you know, she's young, she's naive, she's gullible, she doesn't know any better, and I'm just trying to pave her into a more better direction than where she is now. She does not want to be, she does not want her life fucked up with people like John Holmes. He even tries to get the cops to place him under witness protection with his wife and his girlfriend. Like I said before, Kudrow plays the best performance here, even when he desperately needs her for help. And she abruptly refuses it. It was magic. My guess is that she's the only real adult in this picture. As I mentioned before, she is the only one who I could probably say is the most sincere. Partially because of the fact that she's a nurse. And secondly, she's also because she's straight edge. She doesn't get involved in any illegal or any kind of action that Holmes is. She keeps to herself, and she's the only person who seems to be the only one with a steady head over her shoulders. Nobody else in this movie has that kind of idiosyncrasy. Only her. She's the only person who can probably confess to things in a more cognitive way. And guess what? We actually can believe for every, every word that comes out of her, and we want to. I don't think we could really try to say that about David Holmes' story or or, or John Holmes, David Lynn's story or John Holmes' story. We can't believe them because they're just trying to cover up their innocence. But Sharon Holmes, she actually is genuine because of her sincerity and her honesty. And doesn't have a single ounce of hypocrisy within her, within her regiment. So crime stories based on actual events can have a real level of interest if handled with proper care and details. But it's just terrible, just a shame that Wonderland is so badly shuffled that it's both frustrating and even laboring to watch when it really shouldn't. That's where the weakness is. It really didn't have to. If they would have been more linear in their stories and that we can actually easily get ourselves invested in the already complex story of the Wonderland murders, maybe things would have been a lot better. But when it comes down to it, I think I'll watch the superior and more fun Boogie Nights instead, which focuses on... John Holmes, a.k.a. Dirk Diggler. And it looks more into his life a little bit better. Sure, it doesn't look at him as the druggie, but more like the laid-back party animal porn star. But it's definitely more superior than Wonderland. I wanted Wonderland to be a superior movie 
but it just falls short because of the, I guess because of the editing, which was poor. The directing was poor. And it just, it, just, it should have not been so muddled. If it was a little less muddled, I would have been more invested in this movie. So when all said and done, if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10, I would give Wonderland... I'm sorry to say this. I really don't want to give this movie a low rating, but I have no choice. I have to give this movie a 5. So I guess this ends my right review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I will be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Kurat Ryder saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.